I'm Allison Carter, the Senior Acquisitions Editor for Anthropology at the University of Arizona Press. The University of Arizona Press has been publishing outstanding and award-winning titles in anthropology for decades, and we offer a diverse selection of scholarly books and series. I have been acquiring an anthropology for over 15 years, and I'm really excited to share our latest titles with you. I'm also excited to hear about your own projects. While I will miss meeting everybody in person at the booth at the AAA, I will look forward to seeing you all in the future as soon as we can come together again. Hello, I'm Susan Dean Smith, Associate Professor in the History Department at UT Austin, and I'm here with my co-editors Maruna Akeem and Sandra Rosenthal to give a brief introduction to our new book, Museum Matters, Making and Unmaking Mexico's National Collections. This volume is shaped by an intensive generative two-day workshop attended by the contributors that helped us to focus and sharpen the interdisciplinary conversation among our 10 authors, all prominent scholars based in the Mexican and Anglo-American academies. Hello, I am Iruna Akim, and I'm a professor in the Humanities and Social Sciences Division at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, Coquimalpa, in Mexico City. This is a book about things, stones, relics, bones, fakes, and natural history specimens that made up Mexico's National Museum complex over the course of two centuries of collecting and display. Organized thematically in three sections, canons, fragments, and disturbances, the 10 contributions authored by historians, art historians, curators, and anthropologists focus on specific case studies to show how national collections ever in flux are shaped by different interests, negotiations, conflicts, acts of memory and forgetting, as well as accidents, loss, and serendipitous occurrences. Hi, I'm Sandra Rosenthal, and like Miruna, I'm a professor at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Coajimalpa, Mexico City. The texts in the volume are joined by the original artwork on the book's cover by Mexican artist Mariana Castillo de Val, a wire sculpture that unwinds the shape of one of Mexico's most emblematic objects, the Coyoshauqui. The many shadows and reflections cast by the piece that you can see here behind me evoke many of the book's arguments and invite us to think of museum objects through their layered histories and multiple uses and meanings. We really hope that this volume is helpful to scholars as well as others interested in museums and collections in Mexico and beyond. Voluntourism and multi-species collaboration. It's a critical exploration of the impact of the volunteer tourism industry in the Bay Islands of Honduras. In the book, I'm employing a decolonizing methodology based on landscape assemblage theory to think like a mangrove. And in so doing, readers will immerse themselves in alternative worldings in Utila, ways of being and thinking beyond the hegemonic tourist spectacle dominated world that's attached to the volunteer tourism industry. My goal was to write in a highly readable style and to bring readers along on a journey through the mangroves and waters alongside iguanas, whale sharks, turtles, lionfish, voluntourists, and islanders. The central questions of the work are ones that ask us to consider the impacts of this new alternative tourism market, one that relies on the exchange of affect with other species. I ask how human socialities are made through multi-species relations. What lives and dies in an affect economy? Why are some species killable and who gets to decide? I hope to return to the conference sometime in the future and see some old friends, meet some new ones. Until then, stay safe. Hi, my name is Susan Alexandra Crate, and I'm here to tell you today about a book I just published with the University of Arizona Press. Once Upon the Permafrost is a longitudinal climate ethnography about knowing a specific culture and the ecosystem that that culture physically and spiritually depends on in the 21st century context of climate change. I have spent three decades working with Saha, 
a Turkic speaking horse and cattle agripastoralist culture of Northeastern Siberia, Russia. I show Saha's essential relationship with Alas, the foundational permafrost ecosystem of both their subsistence and their cultural identity. I juxtapose indigenous knowledge with scientific knowledge. For example, Saha know Alas via an indigenous knowledge system imbued with spiritual qualities. This counters the scientific definition of Alas as a geophysical phenomena of limited range. Climate change now threatens Alas due to thawing permafrost, which entangled with the rural changes of economic globalization, youth outmigration, and language loss make prescient the issues of ethnic sovereignty and cultural survival. Through careful integration of contemporary narratives, on-site observations and document analysis, I argue that local understandings of change and the vernacular knowledge systems they are founded on provide critical information for interdisciplinary collaboration and effective policy prescriptions. Furthermore, I make my argument relevant to a wider audience by clarifying linkages to the global permafrost system found in other comparative research in Mongolia, Arctic Canada, Kiribati, Peru, and Chesapeake Bay, Virginia. This reveals how permafrost provides one of the main structural foundations for Arctic ecosystems, which in turn work with the planet's other ecosystems to main, pl maintain planetary balance. Metaphorically speaking, we all live on permafrost. Hi everyone, I am Michaela Marcatelli from Stellenbosch University, and I am the author of Naturalizing Inequality, water, race, and biopolitics in South Africa. This book is about the crisis of inequality in contemporary South Africa. What I show in it is that inequality has not only continued to rise after the demise of apartheid, but it has also largely become normal and even natural. I do so by looking at one particular and extreme example, water access. However, the book is not just about water. As my analysis is grounded in a rural corner of the country called Waterbeck, things like land access, nature conservation, neoliberal growth, and race, especially notions of white belonging, all emerge as crucial to the reproduction and naturalization of inequality. I hope you will enjoy reading my book. Thank you and bye. Open me can toish. Hi, I'm Sim Schneider, and I'm happy to be promoting my book, The Archaeology of Refuge and Recourse, Coast Miwok Resilience and Indigenous Hinterlands in Colonial California. Uh, my book presents the last 20 years of collaborative archaeological and historical research on the indigenous Coast Miwok peoples of coastal central California and their experiences of Spanish, Mexican, Russian, and American colonialism. Uh, indigenous homelands and home waters are at the center of this analysis. And in this book, I explore the concepts of refuge, recourse, and indigenous resilience. So native peoples resisted multiple periods of colonial intrusion, often on their own terms, and by seeking refuge and protection and safety within their homelands. Coast Miwok people also decided when and how to engage with new ideas, new people, and new materials arriving in late 18th century and 19th century California. And Coast Miwok people, my ancestors, were also future-oriented. They resisted colonialism and they rebuilt their communities to remain relevant and connected to the places that still mattered to them. Thank you for reading. Hi, my name is Michelle Deyes and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Mexican American Studies at the University of Arizona. And I'm here to talk to you briefly about my book that was just released last month, Border Women and the Community of Maclovio Rojas, Autonomy in the Spaces of Neoliberal Neglect. This book is an ethnographic exploration into a community that was created in response to the state neglect that many border communities experience. Um, here I'm trying to unpack how local residents are responding to multinational corporations, a nation state that is guided by neoliberal policies, and um, 
how the infrastructure in these northern border cities don't support um, the needs of residents. Maclovio Rojas is the name of the community and it was led and is led by women organizers, um, as you'll note on the cover of the book. And this community really helps us understand how border residents are really transforming their everyday lives. Typically, all we hear about the border is violence, uh, gun trafficking, drug trafficking, and we don't necessarily see it as a place that people actually thrive and live and create. And so my book um, is one way in which we can reimagine the borderlands as a place of transformation. So I invite you to read the book, and if you have any questions, I look forward to being in conversation with you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wes Bernardini, and I'd like to introduce a new University of Arizona Press book titled Becoming Hopi, A History. The book has four editors, two archaeologists, myself and Greg Schachner from UCLA, along with two Hopi tribal members, Lee Kwan Wasioma, the founding director of the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office, and Stuart Koyemtua, the current director. Together, we assembled archaeological evidence, Hopi oral traditions, historical records, and ethnography to present a comprehensive history of the people of the Hopi Mesas. We're proud to have written a truly collaborative book that combines indigenous voices with scientific approaches in a way that respects and enhances both perspectives. The book is full of colorful illustrations and is written in an approachable style making it a valuable resource for anyone who wants to learn about the rich and diverse history of the Hopi people and their enduring connection to the American Southwest. Okay, hello, this is Gesa Mackentun. I'm one of the co-editors of the volume Decolonizing Prehistory. And I would like to tell you a little bit about what motivated us for doing this edition. One of the reasons for doing this volume was our perception that non-Western forms of history making have largely been ignored in the historical sciences. What's presumably missing in these non-Western historical archives is historical accuracy. Uh, for example, they, they are regarded as messy and pure. Um, various essays in this book show that uh, Western historiography is itself arbitrary. Its accounts constantly reformulate the contents of what they call prehistory, you know, events before the introduction of writing. Western scientific knowledge about the distant past, as all knowledge, is under constant revision and in constant flow. And while we know this in theory, the well-known narratives about American prehistory, like Clovis I's narrative, for example, continue to thrive in popular accounts. If not worse, there's a remarkable revival of diffusionist narratives, you know, of Ice Age Europeans discovering America, etc., in the popular media. The volume promotes more dialogical and transcultural ways of reconstructing the past scientifically and it strongly rejects colonialist fake historiography. Hi, I'm Kristen Meacher. I'm the co-editor. I am calling in from Massachusetts. And we wanted to share that a second motivation for the book was to promote more attention for indigenous ways of collective remembering, which are not listed, li limited to the stories, but also use landscape as an archive. There are various essays in this book dealing with the importance of preserving the natural landscape for this reason. The land itself is a part of the archive that combines story and place. The spatial turn in the humanities has made us sensible, for this sensible to this phenomenon. Sometimes the link between a story and a place can contain information about the age of the story as well, as in the case of the stories that preserve knowledge of the volcanic eruption ca that caused the formation of Crater Lake in Oregon more than 7,000 years ago. There are ancient Klamath and Modoc stories about this event, and they're probably the oldest human memories of any of volcanic eruption on a global scale. Third, and finally, it seems important uh, to us to question the implicit catastrophism of the historical narratives the West believes in, narratives beginning with prehistory. These are terminal narratives, in our view, of impending catastrophe, whether climate disaster or species extinction or systems breakdown, they tend to train us to expect the end is near, which weakens humans' ability to adapt to decarbonizing our lives, detoxifying our agriculture, and so on. The continuum between prehistory, history, and apocalypse is a narrative in league with an extractive and exploitative attitude towards non-human life. It's a fatalistic narrative that invites us to leave things as they are, 
Indigenous cultures are less terminal and more adaptable, and they are therefore better suited to furnish us with what's direly needed now, an economy and culture of care and of repair and with a sense of a livable future. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Bye. Hi, my name is Michael Mathewitz, and I'm here to promote a edited volume that uh, my colleague Andrew Turner and I have uh, co-edited for the University of Arizona Press. The volume is entitled Flower Worlds, Religion, Aesthetics, and Ideology in Mesoamerica and the American Southwest, and it is due out in uh, spring of two, tw 2021. And in the volume, we address uh, the, the subject of uh, flower worlds, which are, which are uh, shared tenets of a floral, solar, uh, spiritual domain that's widely shared among indigenous cultures uh, in Mesoamerica and the American Southwest. Um, earlier in Mesoamerica and later in the Southwest. And so this volume uh, has its origin in a SAA symposium and subsequent Ameren Foundation seminar in 2019. And uh, we've brought together a uh, number of scholars from across these regions that have individually addressed the subject of flower worlds, uh, its historical manifestations, its transmission, its nature, and so forth. And uh, so it's the first volume that uh, gives a sort of a comprehensive current view assessment of uh, this study. And so the volume begins with a historical analysis of flower worlds, uh, sort of a, a synthesis and critique. And the first section beyond that is divided into uh, current uh, conceptualizations of flower worlds uh, as a lived experience among indigenous societies in the Southwest and Mesoamerica in a few case studies, including the Huichol, uh, Yoame, uh, Hopi, and the Nahua of the Huastec region of Veracruz. The subsequent section of the volume addresses archeological and uh, early historic period, a colonial period uh, manifestations of the flower world among uh, uh, a number of different societies in uh, uh, Mesoamerica up and into the Southwest. And so we find the, that the volume is going to be broadly appealing to a number of uh, different disciplines, including art history, archeology, span um, indigenous studies, uh, cultural anthropology, and so forth. And so we ask you to take a look at the volume and we wish you a, a very nice meeting. Thank you. This is Therese Gagnon and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies and the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. And I just want to highlight our book, Movable Gardens. This is an edited volume that is co-edited with my mentor and dear friend, Virginia Nazarea. And in this volume, um, all of the authors are writing and talking about connections to food and to place and to identity in the context of migration or displacement of various kinds. And really what all the authors are getting at is a question of how people hold on to a sense of home and identity and rootedness in a modern global context that is continually displacing people in different ways, whether that's economic displacements or forced migration or even industrialization and move to a commodification of food that erases memory and identity and how people create spaces of sanctuary and of radical hope within these experiences of displacement or dispossession. So um, I hope that you are able to get your hands on a copy and hope you enjoy it. And I would really love to hear your thoughts if you wanna be in touch. My email is teresa.gagnon at nias.ku.dk. And I'm also on Twitter, so please do be in touch. Bye. Chokma, I'm Shannon Speed, and I'm Chickasaw, speaking from Tongva Territory at UCLA. Hi, I'm Lynn Stephen, an appreciative settler guest on Kalapuya Iliki at the University of Oregon. 
We'd like to introduce our volume with the University of Arizona Press entitled Indigenous Women and Violence, Feminist Activist Research in Heightened States of Injustice. I suppose the title speaks for itself on what the volume is. It brings together the ethnographic research of eight feminist scholars who have dedicated significant parts of their careers to illuminating the ways in which Indigenous women have challenged communities, states, legal systems, and social movements to promote gender justice within a framework of collective rights. Each of us has in some way engaged our expertise in a wide range of social justice projects, acting as expert witnesses in international, national, and immigration court cases, serving as advisors to Indigenous movements and organizations, and questioning analytical frameworks that reduce Indigenous women to victims and survivors and position researchers as experts. The book offers an intimate view of how settler capitalism and other structural forms of power generate a multiplicity of violence in the lives of Indigenous women. The chapters in the book are engaged, feminist, collaborative, and activist, conveying a powerful message about the resilience of Indigenous women in the face of systemic oppression. The authors also reflect on their own experience of feminist activist research and consider the complexities of and strengths of this approach to scholarship. Themes we engage with include accompaniment with women, collective reparations, testimony as a political act and theory, links between sexual violence on individual bodies and territory, and the ways that gendered violence often is not separate from other forms of racial, ethnic, economic, and physical violence. This volume will be of interest to sociocultural anthropologists and scholars working with indigenous peoples or on topics of power, inequality, and violence. Thanks for listening and enjoy the meeting. Hi, my name is Parker Van Valkenburg, and I'm author of Alluvium and Empire, the Archaeology of Colonial Resettlement and Indigenous Persistence on Peru's North Coast. This book is based on a long-term collaborative research project studying Indigenous people's experiences of colonialism in the Zanya Valley in Peru's North Coast region. Here, like in so many other parts of the Andes, Spanish administrators forcibly resettled Native people into planned towns called Traducciones in the late 16th century. But unlike in many other regions, these towns proved remarkably unstable and they were abandoned and resettled many times over the course of subsequent centuries. In the book, I try to understand both why this happened and also what it meant for indigenous communities. In the process, I draw on archeological survey and excavations to describe indigenous modes of settlement before and after the Spanish invasion, interpret a series of court cases in which indigenous litigants asserted their rights to resettle themselves, and consider what these stories may suggest about empire and indigeneity beyond Peru. I'm sorry that we're not able to meet in person this year, but I look forward to the next chance that we have to get together and wish you health, hope, and peace until that point. Hello everyone, my name is Nick Emlin, and I'd like to tell you today about this uh, book, uh, Language, Coffee, and Migration on an Andean Amazonian Frontier. The book is an ethnography of multilingualism uh, in, the, uh, in the forested foothills between the Andes and the Amazon rainforest of, uh, of southern Peru. Uh, in this area, um, migrants from the, the rural Andean highlands have moved down into the traditional territory of the indigenous uh, Machiganga people. These highland migrants uh, speak Quechua and Spanish, and the indigenous people speak Machiganga. And um, today, uh, the uh, people, uh, many people speak all three of these languages as, uh, as the migrants and the indigenous people have, have, uh, have, have married together. Uh, so the book explores um, how people speak in the course of their day-to-day -day lives, the kinds of discourse genres and ways of speaking that they use as they move between these three languages uh, on, in their day-to-day -day lives. And what this means for the, uh, more broadly, for the expansion of the coffee industry uh, into the rainforest. So it's a sort of a, a linguistic ethnography of uh, economic change and environmental change, but it's also a sort of a coffee economy-based exploration of multilingual practices um, among these three languages in the Amazon. I hope you'll read it and I hope you'll email me and let me know what you think about it. Um, thanks very much. Good morning to all of you and good afternoon to those that are a bit later. I wanted to chat a little bit about um, a new pe a new work, Reflections of a Transporter Anthropologist, uh, to give you an indication of a little bit of its thematics. It's really 
a um, an integration of all of my work for the last 50 years and all of the ideas that went into uh, my development as an applied anthropologist, as well as uh, some of the institutional kind of developments that I was engaged in, in order to conduct uh, applied, right, uh, applied research. So the, the work involves then reflections of both errors, uh, as well as uh, some modest gains that uh, were made uh, during the process of developing uh, this applied anthropology orientation in my work. And it begins, of course, very early on with my first introduction into field work in Ciudad Nezahual Coyotl, Iscali. And that's why the uh, subtitle of the work, which is Reflections of a Transport Anthropology, and the subtitle is uh, From Nezahual Coyotl to Aslan. Because uh, my, my work involves uh, and has involved uh, for many years uh, a transborder and transnational perspective. Uh, gained very early on, by the way, by my own experience as a child uh, uh, in Tucson, uh, where we went back and forth across the border without uh, much fuss, uh, unfortunately, uh, in contrast to today. So the work involves then uh, a number of chapters that's, that, that are devoted to my early development of middle phase, and then this last phase in which all of my ideas about uh, uh, transborder economy and politics and culture, uh, all in fact uh, become integrated in the formation of the School of Transborder Studies uh, at Arizona State University. So take a peek at this work. It, I think it involves insights theoretical ones as well as methodological ones uh, that may assist you in uh, your own development. Uh, and certainly all of these ideas garnered from many, many different sources from the Manchester School uh, in England uh, to the, to uh, in fact, uh, training in, in Mexico, uh, as well as all of the interactions with my colleagues from whom I have learned so much. So I thank you for this opportunity to, to, in fact, introduce you to Reflections of a Transborder Anthropology. Uh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, reflections of a Transborder Anthropologist uh, from Netzawalkoye to Aslan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Emlin, and I'd like to tell you today about this uh, book, uh, Language, Coffee, and Migration on an Andean Amazonian Frontier. The book is an ethnography of multilingualism uh, in, the, uh, in the forested foothills between the Andes and the Amazon rainforest of, uh, of southern Peru. Uh, in this area, um, migrants from the, the rural Andean highlands have moved down into the traditional territory of the indigenous uh, Machiganga people. These highland migrants uh, speak Quechua and Spanish, and the indigenous people speak Machiganga. And um, today, uh, the uh, people, uh, many people speak all three of these languages as, uh, as the migrants and the indigenous people have, have, uh, have, have married together. Uh, so the book explores um, how people speak in the course of their day-to-day -day lives, the kinds of discourse genres and ways of speaking that they use as they move between these three languages uh, on, in their day-to-day -day lives. And what this means for the uh, more broadly for the expansion of the coffee industry uh, into the rainforest. So it's a sort of a, a linguistic ethnography of uh, economic change and environmental change, but it's also a sort of a coffee economy based exploration of multilingual practices um, among these three languages in the Amazon. I hope you'll read it and I hope you'll email me and let me know what you think about it. Um, thanks very much.